the um, comment from Mr. McCarthy that he's seen enough. Well, one of the things that none of us have seen is the warrant application uh, to the court. And it's very important to remember this was not a break in. This was not a raid. This wasn't the attorney general of the United States deciding willy nilly on his own that he was going to do this search. A court had to approve the search here based on, as you pointed out, Lawrence, evidence. And the evidence had to show that there was probable cause of a crime. That is the way our judicial system works. And that is what happened here. I think the thing that I found the most remarkable today and I think it's really worth people just taking a step back is this does mean that the attorney general of the United States did not trust uh, the former president to simply produce the documents voluntarily pursuant to a subpoena, that it was necessary to go by search warrant. Um, normally, you think that if you issue a subpoena to any reputable person, they will produce documents. When you issue um, and obtain a search warrant, it's because you do not trust that the person will actually produce the documents. And that means that they had to have evidence of that uh, that led Merrick Garland to take this step, that it was um, bold, but certainly approved by the courts. Stand up. From a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, tips on keeping your precious documents secure by eating the cloud. And now, the podcast host who would never eat his document storage unless, of course, they're cookies, Pete Dominic. Thank you, Pete Co, and thank you for pressing play and subscribing, reviewing, rating Stand Up with Pete Dominic. I am your host. Joining me today, the great Mike Grunwald, who is co-host of Climavores podcast, policy expert, author, and journalist, talking about the massive new legislation to fight climate change and more. Also, a listener profile. Today, we sit down and learn more about the great Gareth Sever who is one half of the amazing performance duo Buckets and Boards, who is doing a live show, a live streaming show this Thursday, which I'm very excited to watch with you. And I'm very happy I got to sit down and have this long, thoughtful, deep, funny chat with Gareth, who's just a, a great guy and a really important part of the stand-up with Pete Dominic community. Mike Grunwald, Gareth Sever. But first, folks, oh my goodness, last night, the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago, Trump's stupid home in Florida. And my initial response to it was the cable news and social media feeding frenzy is just going to be ridiculous because we don't know much, which is why I played Andrew Weissman, former FBI. He was one of the investigators in the Mueller investigation into Donald Trump. That was him at the top there on MSNBC with Lawrence O'Donnell last night. And in the coming days and weeks, we're going to learn more about what the FBI was looking for in Trump's South Florida estate. But right now, we really don't know. Trump, of course, was the the person really to break the news with a statement through one of his super PACs where he basically talked about being the victim. Right wingers went absolutely crazy last night. Dan Bongino said this is some third world bullshit on Fox News to stupid Jesse Waters. Steve Bannon said we need to choke down the FBI. It railed against the Gestapo feds after the Mar-a-Lago raid. Marjorie Taylor Greene said defund the FBI. The House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy threatened the Attorney General himself. You heard Andrew Weissman referring back to that in that statement there. Trump supporters surrounded Mar-a-Lago to protest the FBI. Raid. Another guy in Fox News named Russ Vaught said it's time to dismantle the FBI into a thousand bits. Lara Trump says the former president was shocked by the FBI raid. This should shake you to your core, said Lara Trump. And uh, Lara, Mark Levin, right wing talker, declared the FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago the worst attack on this republic in modern history. And last but not least, Bernard Carrick said that Democrats may try to orchestrate Trump's assassination. 
after the FBI raid. So that's just a little roundup of some of the comments from Trump supporter world. But more importantly, here's Robert Reich referring to uh, Robert Reich, former Treasury Secretary for Bill Clinton, who I love, referring to Trump's panic statement, who said nothing like this has ever happened to a president of the United States. He says, yeah, well, no president in history has staged an attempted coup to change the outcome of an election. Dave Rathkoff, if you're upset at the FBI for enforcing the law, your problem isn't with the FBI, it's with the law. If you're outraged that the Department of Justice is investigating a serial criminal, your problem isn't with the Department of Justice, it's that you are on the side of a criminal. He goes on to say the howls of abuse of process from the former president and his supporters are once again equal parts projection and deflection. Today's raid was warranted, approved by a judge, overdue, and because it was justified, the opposite of Trump's serial abuses of power. And he also adds, Dave Rothkopf says, the FBI apparently called the Secret Service to inform them of the Trump raid shortly before the raid. I wonder who they're going to call to inform when they are forced to raid the Secret Service to find the documents they have sought to hide. The big question, what is the FBI looking for at Mar-a-Lago? New York Times says the focus appears to be on material taken from the White House. They apparently even broke open a safe. The Former disgraced president was apparently in New York at the time, but the search seemed to center on documents taken from the White House almost surely have required sign off from top officials, according to The New York Times. Mar-a-Lago now officially recognized for what it is a crime scene. A lot of people making the point that Merrick Garland's Department of Justice doesn't leak. Glenn Kirshner tweeted the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago Trump's home. Is a significant barrier broken, a maiden legal voyage. This increases the odds exponentially, in my opinion, that Trump will be indicted for the crimes he inarguably committed against the United States. Perhaps hashtag justice is coming after all. Christian Finnegan says, bad news, guys. The feds only broke into Mar-a-Lago to confiscate an autographed bikini shot of Yasmin Bleeth. So, hmm, interesting speculation from comedian (laughs) friend of the show, Christian Finnegan. And Michael Steele, former chairman of the Republican National Committee, tweeted, Trump failed to return classified documents requested by the National Archives. A federal judge issued a search warrant for probable cause of a crime. This is not some rando move by the FBI. So you shit for brains, Republicans calling for, quote, defunding the FBI for once. Try to be less stupid. And J.L. Covan tweeted, if a sexual assaulting tax cheat who tries to blackmail a foreign leader and instigate a coup can have a legal search warrant executed on his home, are any of us really safe? Jay Black, comedian Jay Black, there would be a beautiful irony if a president who couldn't read was put in jail for hoarding documents. And Wajad Ali writes, a law enforcement must know MAGA is going to get further unhinged, radicalized and weaponized after this Mar-a-Lago raid. This might make these nutty militias come out as well. Hope that the Department of Justice is ready and willing to crack down once if they commit their illegal, violent acts. All right. Well, that's just a roundup of reaction from across the political spectrum. And we'll talk more about it tomorrow here on the show. I'm sure you'll be paying close attention to news. Who are your favorite analysts and experts on this as we speculate about what it could all be? Is it also kind of a waste of time? I don't know. We'll soon find out what it's all about. I'm sure it's all going to come out pretty soon. I hope it's something, because if it's nothing, it's going to be real, real bad. All right. Well, let me then move on to my first guest. I have two great guests, as I said, Gareth Sever in a listener profile. Very excited to have you hear that conversation. But first, I caught up with Michael Grunwald yesterday. He, of course, is a journalist. He's writing a new book right now about how to feed the world without frying the world. He's the co-host of this awesome new podcast with Tamar Haspel called Climavores, which we talk a little bit about today on today's show. It's a new podcast about eating on a changing planet, which is doing really well, he told me. He's the best-selling author and former staff writer for the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and Politico Magazine. He's won all kinds of awards for his reporting, his investigative reporting, and other journalism honors. He's the author of two critically acclaimed books, The Swan. The Everglades, Florida, and The Politics of Paradise, which was adapted for a PBS documentary, and The New New Deal, The Hidden History of Change in the Obama Era, which spent four weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, and the book which I first interviewed him and and met him, and he gained so much of my respect for. So I'm very excited to have Mike joining me. I hope you listen to his podcast, and I think you're really going to like my conversation with him. Follow him on Twitter. Let him know you heard him here, at Mike Grunwald. Let's do it, Mike. 
All right, there he is. I've just told you all about him, his recent work, the podcasts, and great to have Mike Grunwald back on the show. Sir, thank you, as always, for joining me. I'm really happy you were available. Oh, thanks. Thanks to you. It's really, it really is a pleasure. I know you, like everybody always says that automatically because that's what you're supposed to say, but it, I really do enjoy talking to you. Uh, that makes me feel good. Thank you very much, because <laughs> you're one of the main people I wanted to talk to uh, about this big, giant bill that is uh, going to pass, I guess, this week in the House. I, I don't think there's really any any doubt about that. It's out of the Senate, which is interesting. We can always talk about the politics of it all, Mike. But but your your big takeaways on this, I, I just I had to get to you because you you're the guy who writes about where these policies where the rubber meets the road i need a better phrase <laughs> this is good <laughs> it's really good you know I mean, we talk about so much so much about how oh, oh, all these people in washington they suck why don't they do this why don't they do that this is what they should do this is great i mean uh you know i'm i'm the climate nerd so i'm particularly focused on the climate stuff the climate stuff is really good it's like 300 Seventy billion dollars, almost all of it, to try to move towards that clean energy economy that we so desperately need, so that we don't torch our planetary home. It's good. Who's involved in the sausage making on this one? From across the energy sector, you can imagine there are all kinds of renewable energy lobbyists looking for tax credits, incentives for. Uh, governments and individuals to buy their products. And you can imagine that there's legacy fossil fuel lobbyists saying, don't do this, don't do that. And then you've got senators like Joe Manchin signing on to it. And you question, well, well, that's what's that all about? And then we we learn that he's got a pipeline. And when we freak out, like, how was the sausage made on this one? Who's in the room? And, and it seems like pretty much everybody in clean energy was. You know, it's a, it's a really good question, Pete. And, and you know, I've had to do a lot of soul searching about this because, again, like I'm the, you know, policy wonk. I think about, you know, do we need a carbon tax or should we doing this through subsidies or what's the best way? And, you know, which of these policies work better? And should we have Davis Bacon laws and prevail? I mean, all of this really complicated stuff. But I think the first thing we have to say about this is it happened because there are 50 Democrats in the Senate. Mm. If there were 49 it doesn't happen. If there were 52, obviously all this drama of the last you know year and a half with Joe Manchin, that doesn't happen. But the main thing that happened is that the you know the worst, the most climate unfriendly Democrat, Joe Manchin, turned out to be climate friendlier than every single Republican in the Senate. Um, and because of that, things are getting done. And the climate stuff. Now look, and this some of this is not my expertise, but you know there's re- very popular stuff in there about you know, making prescription drugs cheaper, um, about raising corporate taxes um, that maybe has some real political boost. The climate stuff, they're not even selling it. That's in there because Democrats thought it was important to do and Republicans didn't. And it's happening because there are 50 Democrats. So I think that's the first thing you got to say about who did this. The Democrats did it. That's a really important and great point and goes along with your first point about why don't they ever do anything? They did it. They actually did it, yeah. and they could not have done it without. I talked with uh, Michael Cohen about this yesterday. They could not have done it without the the Georgia runoff. The the writer, columnist Michael Cohen. That's right. And that's right. And 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 look, I think uh, what what you asked about. It's true that there are a, a, so many people who have worked really hard on this for a long time. You know, people in the clean energy industry, yes, but also just you know advocates who really wanted to do the right thing, who worked. You know, not so much drumming up the masses who, for the most part, like, you know, would like to see climate action, but it's not a big driving priority for them, but really getting to the Democratic leaders. And I do think we got to mention that there are a bunch of Democratic senators, um, not the famous ones, right? Um, Not the ones who are in the press all the time, but the Tina Smiths. The Martin Heinrich from uh, from New Mexico, Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, um, Brian Schatz from Hawaii. Yeah. Um, these are not people who, you know, who get a lot of press. Ed Markey from Massachusetts. But these guys really cared that this had to be a climate bill. And because of them, it was it wasn't because people were were screaming for it. When you look around and I've looked around a little bit at, at reactions 
from writers and journalists who write about climate to some of the senators that you just mentioned who have been advocating and warning for years to someone like Bill McKibben, who is one of the leading influencers in, in, in the world of environmentalism and, and conservation and an activist, a writer. He wrote 34 years and 40 days ago, Jim Hansen, the scientist, broke the news of global warming to the U.S. Senate. Finally, today they act in reference to, to, the, uh, to this policy we're talking about. He writes, it's late. It's deeply compromised, and it's also a great victory for all who have fought so long and hard. Such thanks to all of you and on to the next battles. It's that kind of nuanced reaction, but that comes out with mostly, hey, this is good. And then you have filmmakers like Adam McKay and other cynical you know, progressives who don't read the bill and just go, this is bullshit because of this or that. And I saw you reacting to that, and I, I just thought, What is your reaction to all of the reactions, Mike? Well, it's true. I mean, look, I think we have to say that most people are being rational about this. I mean, if you care about the planet, if you want the United States to be able to be a global climate leader um, and not, you know, you don't want John Kerry to be telling China to do stuff on climate when we're not doing anything at home and he looks ridiculous. Mm. Um, You know, this is great. This is a, you know, it's not everything. It's not Bernie Sanders, $16 trillion, you know, green new deal plan, but that was never realistic. And politics is the art of the possible. And this is what was possible. And, you know, I, again, I, I do think like, I don't want to overly harp on the Adam McKay's of the world, but they really do piss me off. This kind no, of, I, I, uh, I want you to, I want you to, because a lot of those <laughs> type of people listen to the show and I actually, I, I, I'm here to save them from themselves because I've saved myself. <laughs> I've saved myself from the kind of cynicism when I, when I, when I look at pragmatism and, and nuance and, you know, that's not what social media is. And that's we're reacting to Adam McKay, the filmmakers uh, tweets here on this. But I go ahead and, 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 and talk about why that reaction pisses you off. Well, look, I mean, I do think that there's this, you know, sort of pernicious idea. And it's, you know, it's it's pretty it's got quite a foothold on the left um, that basically, you know, both parties suck. All politicians suck. Um, they, that it's all run by big money. Um, this was my problem with The Big Short, which was a fun movie, but uh, but basically, you know, pretended that there hadn't been a really serious financial reform after uh, you know after the financial crisis of two thousand eight. And which, by the way, we just went through this COVID disaster, and the banks held up. There wasn't another financial crisis because of the things that were done in two thousand eight really that Adam, that, that that's Adam a- McKay hated so much. Um, you know, that he said was all empty theater, all run by the banks um, because everybody in Washington is in on the game. It's all a joke. And, it, and he had the same reaction to this. It's like, oh, look, there's something in there for fossil fuels. This is just more both parties in it together. It's bullshit. But like I said, I think part of being a grown up is recognizing that they don't all suck, that the ones who do suck, they don't all suck equally. Um, and that you have to, you know, sometimes good sausage comes out of the sausage making. And this is a case where, you know, it is not perfect because nothing that is done by human beings is ever perfect, except, I don't know, maybe Hamilton and et cetera, right? and Coca-Cola. But, uh, but, you know, this is really good. This is progress. And I do think that a lot of pro- progressives are sometimes kind of allergic to progress because they find it more fun to just complain about the progress that isn't happening. Well, you know, in, in your joke is, is, is funny, but it but it's also depicts these types of progressives, often myself in that category, that can tell you why Coke is bad, why Excedrin is bad <laughs> right. and why Hamilton has some flaws. <laughs> You know, there, there's always something. All right. Coke, Coke does have some problems. Okay. <laughs> Diet Coke, however. Really <laughs> uh, so you are, of course, writing this book about how to feed the world without frying the world. You're also uh, co-hosting this amazing podcast that I wish you did more episodes of, but at least one a week, Climavores, uh, with Tamir Haspel, who I also had on the show. And I can't I should have you both. On she to loved talk. it. I know. She, was, yeah. she told me she had Tomorrow's a great time. Awesome. 
But uh, you guys are both awesome and together even better. Uh, but you've also written this piece over at uh, Canary Media, where you're now a columnist. Really great media outlet, by the way. People should check it out. Uh, titled Three Smart Ways the U.S. Can Grow More Food While Emitting Less Carbon. You guys also, I think your most recent, was it most recent? A podcast about 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 this as well and land yields. It's really fascinating, super important. People should read this article, listen to that podcast. But as it relates to this bill, kind of jumping right. out of it, I know you're not satisfied with what the bill does. What for food farming? Yeah, what? well, I mean, it's fun again. Like you know, I love this bill, and I think this is a great example of you know making the world a better place. That said. My obsession the last couple of years is how to feed the world without frying the world and, uh, you know, how to fix our food and agriculture problems. Um, the IRA does throw a fair amount of money at climate smart agriculture. Um, doesn't really say exactly what it is. Some of that money might be helpful. But I do lay out that there are really there are three kind of obvious things that uh, that the U.S. government should be doing to try to lead the way um, towards a more sustainable food system. And the IRA does not do any of them. Um, I'll, you know, give away my my column, but they're basically we need a sort of a moonshot for fake meat because we have got to reduce our meat consumption in the first world because, you know, they're just the emissions that come particularly from from beef are just so much higher than would come from from plants that there needs to be some sort of people love meat. I love meat. These substitutes right now, they're not good enough and not cheap enough, and the government can help. Second is a similar moonshot for food waste. It is absurd that the world wastes a third of our food. That means we waste a third of the land, a third of the fertilizers and pesticides and fresh water that we use to grow all that food that we waste. It's a disaster. It's stupid. Unlike the meat stuff, there's no pro-food waste lobby we just got to get on this. And they have they have gotten on it in some countries and they've made a real difference in the UK and Korea. And then the final one is we really need to invest in agricultural innovation so that we can make more food on less land. You know, we did that during the Green Revolution, right, which was awesome. It saved the world from untold famines. Um, we made you know, we increased farm yields, but we did it in a really dirty way um, that created all kinds of you know, toxic chemicals, uh, water pollution, air pollution, all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, now we just need a greener green revolution and the government can help. Um, you're going to see alternative pesticides, alternative fertilizers, um, ways that you can, you know, basically make more food on the same amount of land so that we don't have to tear down the rainforest, but without the kind of negative consequences we've had from agriculture. And it's really hard, but this is what the federal government is good at. You know, we did it with clean energy. We did it with solar, wind, um, electric vehicles. You know, you invest in the research, you in invest in the initial deployment, and then the market will take care of itself. But we're just, you know, we're 25 years behind on food and, and agriculture, and we need to get going. That's a really interesting and important article, uh, and you mention it and give it away. Everybody should go read it, and uh, I'll link to it in the show notes and, and on Twitter. But Accelerate Alternative Proteins, you talked about fake meat and the problems with beef. Attack food waste, and you mentioned UK and Korea. Could you just say one more word about, like, when I see that as one of your three, I, I, I say, well, that must be, I'm sure, I understand why it's hard. Maybe I don't. But it's got to be one of the easier things to solve. We've got the food. We've grown it. And and, and how do we not waste it? What are they doing in other countries? I, I, I've heard from listeners who, who try to, you know, do things locally in restaurants and nonprofits and so on. Tons of organizations like Why Hunger in the, in the U.S. But w what are they doing? W why is it so hard? I mean, food waste is a really interesting problem. Well, first of all, it's kind of two different problems. In the first world, in the rich world, our problem is like what you think it is. Like, you know, we put avocados, you know, we get avocados at those grocery store. They're a little soft. We throw them in the fridge. By the time we take them out they're they've gone bad. We go to the restaurant, we order too much food. We throw half of it out. You know, that's, that's the kind of classic food waste. And then in, in the developing world, it's, it's more kind of food loss where, you know, they have primitive harving, harvesting equipment. So, you know, the food rots in the field or the roads or so, or they have, you know, bad storage. So, you know, rodents eat the food while it's being stored. And then they have these primitive supply chains. So they can't get the food to market and it rots there. They don't have, they don't have refrigerated trucks. So, so they're kind of different problems. 
Some of them can be solved through government. You know, a, a perfect example is sell by dates, which are incredibly misleading. And people throw out perfectly good food because they see a date on their, uh, you know, on their milk that has nothing to do with whether the food is good or not. Um, you know, there can be government reforms of that. There can be government education programs. There can be government composting. You know, can do things to prevent food waste. But I'm, you know, just as I am with fake meat. I'm really excited about the prospect of American technology. And you see these companies, my favorite is probably Appeal Sciences, which is they're out in Santa Barbara and they're, a, you know, one of these unicorns. But what they do is they, ha they, they make these, bi they're a biotech company, but they make these organic, invisible, tasteless peels. They, you know, they're sort of, you don't see them, but you can put them, you can go to Kroger's today and get an Appeal avocado. And it's basically an avocado but then it's covered in this peel that basically keeps the air out and the water in and uh, prevents it from going bad. It stays good three times longer. What? Um, Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Hey, it's new. It's new. But if you go to Kroger, they have a peel avocados. And, you know, they've, part of it is like they don't want people to get freaked out. It's like, oh, it's biotech food, but it doesn't affect what's inside the avocado. And eventually they're going to do it for strawberries and raspberries and all kinds of things. And hopefully, you know, you can even do it. You can imagine doing it for more staple crops uh, that don't spoil quite as easily, but have all kinds of food waste problems in the developing world. Oh, wow. I'm, re I'm reading about it. I'm reading about it now. Unfortunately, appeal uh, is made of lead. That uh, seems controversial, <laughs> no, Michael. No, no, Oh, I must Stop be on the wrong it. website. This is cool stuff, right? Like, you know, blockchain. Think of People think of that stuff as like, ew, Bitcoin. But, you know, these are technologies that can help supermarkets trace their inventory better. Um, you know, the Internet of Things, which sounds like this kind of whiz-bang thing. But, you know, you're... In in the future, your your refrigerator is going to tell you when your food is going to go bad. And these are all the kinds of this is the sort of stuff that this is America's secret sauce um, that, you know, and what we saw with renewable energy is a lot of the technology started in the United States and now they're being manufactured abroad. And hopefully the IRA will help, you know, create some of that manufacturing in the United States. But it would be great on the food side if we could develop the technology in the United States and then make it in the United States. Wow, this is really interesting. A P E E L dot com, and not to mention everything else you just said about technology and and why you know. I guess the question always becomes, yeah, but we're in a race here, a race against time. Yeah. And does the technology and do markets and and does human behavior and politics cooperate to get us anywhere close to where we need to be? And it would seem that a lot of the experts, and I was reading about this, the people who crunch the data. And to try to get the truth about uh, carbon emissions and what a policy in this case, hypothetically, hopefully, uh, but in, in, in reality, would do to bring down our emissions. The people who analyze such things say that this bill would actually get us there, that it's not it's not bullshit. And people like White House, Sheldon Whitehouse and other senators and, and Bernie Sanders even aren't necessarily arguing that, much less the scientists like my friend, Dr. Michael Mann. So that's super important. It really does bring down our, our carbon emissions. Is that right? That's right. No, exactly. And it's and this is look, which they're already they're already starting to come down. We're doing better. And it's been a technological victory. Now, as you know, I banged my spoon in my high chair about the Obama stimulus, which, you know, I wrote a book about. And that really, you know, jump started a lot of a lot of solar, wind, electric vehicles, particularly on the battery side, LED lighting. Um, but because these technologies are now becoming mature and, you know, I have solar panels on my, you know, on my roof, they're going to pay for themselves in seven or eight years. You know, they just become smart. The idea is if we can get, you know, the, the more now it's just a race to deploy them uh, makes a big difference whether, you know, 10 percent of the country has gone solar or half the country. And that's the difference between, you know, whether we hit two degrees or one point five or two point five. All of these, you know, more emissions are bad, <laughs> you know, less emissions are better and better is better than worse. And so the more we can do to encourage the cleaner technologies, the worse it's going to be for the, the dirtier ones. Quick question on on EVs. You and I have been driving EVs for years, yeah. and yeah. Uh, we realize also that when gas prices have been so high that interest really uh, starts to ga yeah. gain in these. And then I just read an article, it starts to wane when prices, when prices <laughs> go down. These vehicles... I, I, 
Hasn't it been really fun driving past all those gas stations and, you know, just looking at the prices and, uh, you know, thinking like, oh, that's gas I don't have to buy. Yeah, it's also <laughs> really fun that now I got a newer <laughs> Volt and I, I plug it in at a garage in New York when I go in there once a week. And that charger, speaking of technology, charges it up much faster. In, in two hours, I have almost a full charge. So, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's really exciting that you can stay on electric, even with a, a battery like mine, which is more limited for 50 miles. The point I'm, you know, in this bill and where are we? Because these vehicles, a buddy yeah. of mine just bought a beautiful, uh, is it Hyundai or which one? Yeah. The Icon, the Ionic 5. Gorgeous car. Oh, yeah. So the, so the ads for that. Yeah. $60,000, though, Michael. So, so right. where no. are we on EVs for personal yeah. use? And I know that the bill... <laughs> Uh, spends billions of dollars to buy things like, uh, you know, new government vehicles like uh, like mail trucks and stuff. So where are we on EVs and what does this bill do to make it more affordable for people to buy them? Well, look, some of them are more expensive, but, but they're still, you know, the Bolt is the Bolt is a lot cheaper. Um, uh, you know, I got mine had been sitting on the lot for about after including the seventy five hundred dollar tax credit, which was still available at the time. Uh, I ended up paying twenty three thousand for for my Bolt. Um, and, you know, and again, like. <laughs> every every time I drive eight eight miles, it's like putting another dollar in the uh, in the in the cookie jar. Um, the uh, the bottom line is that the IRA will create a lot more incentives. You know, the not only for, for new cars, um, which Tesla and GM they had run out, they had they had exhausted. I think it was two hundred thousand cars where all you would get the tax credits for. Now there's going to be no limit, so that you can again, if you buy a new. EV starting next year, you'll get the $7,500 off, whether it's an expensive one or a cheap one, although there are income limits. So super rich people won't be able to, to get them. Um, but also used EVs, um, they're trying to promote that market. Oh. I think it's a $4,000 tax credit. Um, there also, there are a lot of kind of stringent conditions down the road that to try to make them more manufactured in the United States with more union labor. Um, Again, trying to create this industry in the United States, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but again, I always point out that when I wrote my stimulus book, right, that, that had a billion dollars for electric vehicle battery con uh, factories. Um, and at and at the time, there was all kinds of uh, there were all kinds of just you know horrible news stories about the because there were no electric vehicles then yeah um and there were these factories that were just sitting empty uh, you know the workers were playing cards on the factory floor um it was like seen as this big scandal but you know now my bolt runs on a battery that was built in one of those factories and that's part of what this bill is going to do that's huge investment on the manufacturing side, tax credits, to try to get people to invest in building factories to build the green stuff in the United States, whether that's, you know, the components for electric vehicles or geothermal technology or wind turbines. Um, the idea is just to really promote the industry so that it gets bigger, it gets cheaper, and then more people, you know, become green consumers. Just a word, one word, or five, if you want. I know you don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we have to spend time on it. What, do you, what does it say that all of the Republican Party in the Senate voted against? Even the quote, I don't know what word we want to call them, but the, I, maybe it should be really nuanced. Those who did not, they still believe in democracy. They don't think the election was fraudulent. I don't know, because I'm not going to call them moderates, I guess, but like a Mitt Romney. Uh, or or any any other Republican senator, the the Amer the only political party fully in denial about the science or against any doing anything about it in the whole world is the Republican Party. We'll see what they do in the House where they're crazy. They're not going to vote for it, most likely. What do you say mm -hmm. about the politicians in America, much less those in media who still deny the problem and ridicule the solution like like they are here by saying nobody can afford these cars or whatever other bullshit they come up with? Right. I mean, look, I mean, I guess some of the rhetoric has changed where you don't see as much outright denial where people like global warming isn't happening. It's become too obvious. But at some point, if you're going to vote against the things that are going to against climate action, you know, that's a different form of denial. And yeah, like look, this, is, it's a little uncomfortable because, you know, I'm a nonpartisan policy analyst. Right. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not rooting for one of the teams. But I think if you stand outside and just look at this, you have to say, 
one of the teams is pushing for climate action and the other isn't. And so, you know, right, there was this, there was this whole question over like, you know, and, and I thought it was kind of gross where the Democratic Party was actually helping some of these like super lunatic right wing MAGA guys who were in primaries against presumably more moderate pro-democracy Republicans. And the idea is to try to get an extremist elected in the Republican primary so that the Democrat would have a better chance of beating yeah. him. And look, I, th I think that's a little bit gross because, you know, if you really think these threats to the democracy are a real threat, don't want to promote it. But if all you care about is the climate, it's perfectly rational because that moderate Republican is going to vote exactly the same as the wackadoodle Republican. That's what we've seen. And so, like, you know, Again, this is uncomfortable for people like me who aren't supposed to be saying like, you know, yay team. But I think we just have to say that only one team is playing this game and the other team's just trying to obstruct it. Well, I am a partisan and I <laughs> I just a word on that because I, I want to get your, your quick take. I have read a lot of people I respect criticizing that that idea, that strategy, Democrats promoting Republicans. I have no problem with it at all. I think. Winning is the only thing they think matters on the right for different reasons, and they will cheat and they will deny the results to claim victory. In this case, Democrats are promoting people they think they can beat and people point to, well, look, nobody thought Trump would get elected. And look, at I just I think that's different. And I just don't have a huge problem with Democrats trying to win. Well, I think that's fair. And look, I think it's not irrational. And uh, but I do remember the people who in 2015 were, you know, the Democrats who were saying, let's, you know, promote Trump because he's the most beatable. And that didn't work out so well. So I think you got to have a little bit of humility about your ability to know about these things. And I guess the one other thing I would say, and this is maybe a little bit beyond my my ken, but it, it, it reminds me of some of these uh, some of these green issues also where where I talk, you, you hear a lot in the green world about how like, oh, it's not about individual action. Stop yelling at people to recycle or, you know, eat less beef, um, because what really matters is the, uh, you know, we have to change the sure. policies. We have to get corporate America to change. And again, that's rational. At some level, that's way more important. But what I'm always saying is like, hey, we're saying this is a climate emergency. We're saying this is a climate crisis. And then we're telling people that what they do doesn't matter. Like, if we think it's a crisis, you got to act like it's a crisis. And I think that's something about that with democracy, too. Like, if we really think that, you know, it's complete, you know, the, the, the future of the American Republic is at stake um, because of these MAGA guys who don't believe in democracy, then you shouldn't actually be helping them, I think. Like, you shouldn't be giving them a better chance of, you know, getting to to, you know, inflict their inflict their anti-democratic ideas on the country that and it, and as a democratic brand, I guess you don't want to be the you know, if you want to be able to say, like, we think this is a real threat. And I do think that, you know, these kind of like political operative games, which I understand and maybe they're rational, but it does kind of undercut that message to a normal person who doesn't follow this stuff. That's a great point uh, for sure. And it's always a, a point worth mentioning to people who don't you know, who do follow this stuff. Not everybody does. Not everybody's like you. All right. Last question for you. You guys have been doing great episodes uh, of Climavores continuing a recent episode on vertical farms. Are they the real solution? Hot farm enlisting unconvinced farmers. And your most recent episode is today's food crisis is a postcard from our warming future, which is really fascinating conversation. But just one question, uh, I'll ask you one, and then people have to go listen to the podcast. I think food production is, is, is fascinating. I think farming or agriculture culture, the culture around it is fascinating. All of the products, all of the science, all of the, the history and demand for it. Everybody eats, everybody needs food. And I am super, con very interested in agriculture, but know very little about it. What is, where are we at, at least in the U.S.? And do you, do you get into it? I haven't heard this episode about internationally, what farmers, what agriculture is doing differently. And, and, you know, I, I always feel like capitalism is so at play because these really small time farmers have such a hard time or organic farmers making any kind of profits because overhead is so much. And there's all these other things. W what do we learn here? And what do you want to say about 
what we need to do to convince farmers? <laughs> well, you know, one of the uh, you know, one thing that's been fun about our podcast is I think, you know, Tamar and I were journalists, we're fact people and people who, are, who know a lot about food and farming really do seem to be tu- tuning in. And you know, sometimes we're pretty provocative. I mean, we're not, you know, we're for, especially from a climavore perspective where we talk about the climate, organic farming is not always the best option. We had a really, I, our vertical farming episode that you mentioned, which is actually, it's been our, been our bet number one rated episode really? so far. I mean, it's real. it's been, uh, huh. you know, we've now, I think we've, Increase from the first few episodes, we've listenership, I guess you'd call it, is up 800%. Wow, it's, uh, that's it's great. Really exciting. That's but great. Far- yeah, but the vertical farming was a really interesting one because, in a way, vertical farms, it's kind of this magical solution to all of the problems with outdoor agriculture, right? All the things that Tamar and I talk about all the time about, you know, it's like you might not get the same yield because you have all these, especially in a climate driven world, um, you're going to start losing harvest to the heat and the floods and the, you know, the droughts. Um, you have all these food safety issues where the birds are pooping on your, are pooping on your food all day long. Um, you just outdoor farming is chaos. You don't control it. Yeah. And you put it into these little vertical, you know, into these indoor factories, these food factories where it's run by artificial intelligence and led lighting. And it's incredibly cool. But we talked about how, it sort of doesn't pencil out. Um, And so we kind of, in a way it's a debunking episode, but then we went beyond that to sort of talk about how, what what outdoor farming can learn from vertical farming. So I thought it was, it was really cool. And we're, I think we're coming at these issues in a way that nobody has before and people seem to be responding. Congratulations. Um, That's great to hear. I I, I'm told that you got a huge bump after your first appearance here on, on stand up at pizza. I think so. I think, uh, absolutely. (laughs) No, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like being, you know, promoted on what was like the Amazon thing, or it's like, like Oprah's book club. It's the, uh, it's the Oprah's book club for podcasts. Would you ever like, I really do appreciate it. Would you ever not go on a super popular show because their host is really controversial and you disagree with almost everything he or she says? Like, would you not go on, I don't know, anything from Fox News to Joe Rogan or something to promote? I would totally go on Joe Rogan. You would. I got to yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Does that make me a bad person? I don't but, think so, uh, because no, like, I, I went uh, on it. I did, I did a three hour <laughs> conversation with him and like two hours of it was us arguing. It's not and he doesn't edit it. So it's like it's not like you can't say whatever you want. But no, uh, I think. I think it's great. I mean, look, look, well, I'm a I'm a journalist, so I'm just sort of spitting into the wind and, you know, or whatever, throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping something sticks. But basically, you know, I'm stay, I'm doing my research. I'm saying my stuff. I want people to hear it. You know, if then they say, like, I don't give a shit because, you know, I'm this isn't this isn't my thing. You know, that's that's OK. But I'd, I'd rather they at least get to hear it. Well, I'm glad I get to hear it, and I really appreciate you joining me today. Keep up the great, great work with the podcast, the writing, the everything that you're doing, and it's always great to catch up with you, Mike. Thank you so much. Pete, thanks. Thank you. Love your show and love everything you're doing. All right, and there he goes. Thank you very much to Michael Grunwald for sitting down with me yesterday, and thank you for listening to this podcast. I can't do it without your paid subscriptions, but I also – have to thank Indeed.com for sponsoring the program, because if your business is your dream, well, you want the people who share it and have the skills to help it grow to find them faster. You need Indeed. Indeed.com slash stand up right now. You can get a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your post at Indeed.com slash stand up. The offer is only good for a limited time. So go claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash stand up terms and conditions do apply if you need to hire you need indeed and i should probably tell you in a minute or less that i've been talking to you 16 hires were made on indeed so get to it everybody indeed.com slash stand up go hit that link right now go crush it and i'll thank you personally later all right now that that is taken care of i am very very honored and and excited and i guess flattered in a way because 
My next guest on the show is a longtime listener and subscriber and super talented performer. And I guess I say flattered because the idea that I have been able to create this community, albeit kind of accidentally, and connect people with each other and even profile them here on the show and hopefully help them in some way or another. And so many people have connected with each other and helped each other and Garrett is one of those people that's the greatest that's the greatest feeling and I am very grateful that this community did so many people and helped so many people I hear from you all the time and now I want to share with you whenever it seems right someone who is a very talented interesting kind thoughtful hilarious and very successful artist husband and father and he's one half of the buckets and boards comedy percussion show which is a hilarious high energy and very interactive show that he and his partner matt levingston have been performing for years now and it's so good a lot of listeners have seen it when it goes on the road and you can see it in branson missouri where they perform over the summertime also he performs they perform on disney cruise ships and all kinds of other places you can hire them you can see them you can support them on patreon as well he's been a huge hit at several of our thursday night hangouts where he literally just sits back and listens and take notes and then writes a whole song and performs it for us and it's hilarious and poignant and i'm just so excited to introduce him to everybody as well as promote his live show this thursday which you're going to hopefully be going to instead of the hangout because i'm going to be on the road this thursday night but i'll try to make it up one way or another to the buckets and boards live show all of the links to learn more about gareth and matt buckets and boards and gareth individually in today's show notes but i really hope you'll support him and go watch at least some of it if not all of it live thursday night and when he comes to your town ladies and gentlemen my conversation with gareth sever Oh, I never really even told you where we were. You, you asked me when I first started listening to you, but it was, we got like free XM with a car for three months. Like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Oh. So I, I, I came across you and then I was hooked. I was hooked. Wow. Okay. So you, you started listening in the serious XM years. Yeah. But it was off and on. It was like three months at a time here. And then we randomly get another car that had it couple of so you later, were not go, well, you oh, were, it was no. more accidental based on whether or not you yeah. had free Sirius XM in the car yeah <laughs> yeah I see where your loyalty yeah. to the show well, they, the old show every time they they'd start trying to charge it I, or I'd buy, I think I bought it for a year but it was on like this super great discount and you're like oh this is awesome and then they auto charge you like seven hundred dollars and they're like this is for the next three months no I loved having to answer from listeners and family members to customer service, like people, like even neighbors would complain. You know, I bought the Lifetime and they're trying <laughs> to charge me for yeah. more for radio. I'm like, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't I, tell yeah. you. My show's on channel 121, oh. nine to noon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am recording and I'm really happy to have you joining me. I've just told everybody all, all about you in the intro and we full disclosure just talked for about an hour and it's so great to, to get to know you better and to learn about your life. I already liked you a lot and admired you and listeners have loved your contributions to the show in terms of the jingles. And of course your contributions at the hangouts, which are some of the most brilliantly improvised moments I've ever seen in my life. And I've seen a lot of good stuff. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to do this, uh, this listener profile on you. And more importantly, just if you would right away, right here at the top, tell people what is going to happen Thursday night. I'm every, I'm telling everybody, skip the hangout. I might start early, but you are yeah. going live. Buckets and boards going live from where and why should people watch, Gareth? Oh, man. Uh, well, I'll tell you, it's uh, Thursday at 730 Central live stream full stage show from Dick Clark's American Bandstand Theater right in the heart of Branson, Missouri. And uh, it's our final show of our summer season that we do here in Branson. We've been doing for about 13 years. And we finally, because we're so technologically advanced, we uh, hired a junior in high school, this great guy, Landon, uh, who's been live streaming concerts and athletic events at the high school. He's uh, got it all set up to, to do a ticketed live stream show uh, of our, our full length two hour show out of Branson, Missouri. 
And we, we think uh, everybody would love it. It's, it's a fun show for kids and families and old people, probably, too. I mean, you seem to really not care about old people at your show just now there at the end. No, actually, we, uh, we honor old people. Oh, you do? During, during the, show. the show? Oh, yeah. Probably. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, you we will, will now. On Thursday, we're going to have a special. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, if you're... <laughs> If you're over if you're a certain over age, 70, yeah. try to stand up. <laughs> well, the great thing, one of the great things about your show, there are many great things that you and, and Matthew, can I call him your partner? Will that confuse people? You're married yep. to a woman. You have three daughters, but you also, you have a business and performance yeah. partner. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we've, we, we said that to somebody, we were watching somebody else's show in Branson yeah. and, and, uh, this lady said, said something, asked, asked us about our show. This old lady that was at the show, she goes, I go, oh, well, me and my partner. And she goes, what? What kind of a show is this? And I was like, are you, are you for real? <laughs> like, are you, you're appalled? What are, what's your At that point, reaction? you should have just gone full hog and been like, make out the whole show. That's what we do. <laughs> anyway, what were we saying? <laughs> that's, me that's and my partner. And you're going to like it. And you're going to, uh, yeah. it's going to bring things up in you and some of your loved ones. <laughs> you're not going to know what to do with those things. And that's why we do the show. Yeah. And just in case you didn't know, ma'am. Every show you're watching here and anywhere, there's gay people in it. No, no, there yes. aren't. Yes. Not in this show. I'm and moving. Magnificent. I'm moving to. I'm moving to Iran, where they aren't. So you and your partner Matthew will. You know what I was going to say. One of the great things is that it's interactive, which is great for kids and families. But you you bring people up and bring them into the percussion, the performance elf and yeah. listeners who have gone have absolutely loved that. But you know, you're still going to be doing that. Even this Thursday live stream, you will have audience victims, right? Audio, audience. That's what, I, that's what yeah. they are at my show. Yeah. That's what they are at my shows. Yes, I believe it. Yeah. And, uh, and the whole show is like interactive back and forth with the audience. And the more we've done it, the more years we've, we've gone through it, we've allowed ourselves more space to, improv and play off the audience and kind of just gotten a little braver with it. And that's made the show so much more fun and, and hopefully more fun for the crowd. It's too. such a great show. It's such an original show. You've had a really interesting career and I'm going to come back to, to all of that, but I wanted to start where little Garrett Sever started. Cause you had a, you've had a really interesting life. Your family's very interesting. Your brother is actually a really successful, well-known musician himself is Matt the electrician. I've just subscribed or followed him on, on Spotify and your sister owns like and runs a, a vineyard with her husband in Oregon called Harris bridge vineyard. And so if listeners, you know, I just like to give shout outs. These are two people that are connected to Gareth and we obviously we're excited awesome. to support his work and his whole family's work. But your dad, Gareth, I just want to start there and ask you about him because your dad was apparently a very talented carpenter and somehow yes. he got, a crazy weird gig, which was building George Lucas's Skywalker ranch, like the main home or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. But what it meant was as at age seven, and you and I are the same age yes. when star Wars was at its height. And when there were just a few movie stars and <laughs> no one had access to them in real life, you did you party at Skywalker ranch. Cause your dad yeah. built it. What? Yeah, yeah, Tell me yeah, about this. Essentially, <laughs> every 4th of July, George would have a 4th of July picnic for everybody that worked for him. And that included my dad. You know, it was the carpenters and the plumbers and there was directors and that he worked with and actors. And shoot, uh, Michael Jackson was at one of them <laughs> walking around with a couple bodyguards and a cowboy hat and a bandana around his face. Didn't want to get the dust. You know, we followed him around for a while as boys are prone to do. What? I mean, that's just a crazy childhood experience. Yeah. Your, your no, dad. But, Go ahead. It was, oh, it was just really cool. It was like, such a neat thing that George Lucas would do because, yeah, you just, it, it made everybody feel special. And you got to, we were playing softball and, you know, uh, throwing horseshoes with like people from the Ewok movies. And then oh, look over there and there's Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher. And it was my job as the seven year old to, if, I, if somebody wanted an autograph, I would go up and ask for the autograph. So I got to meet a lot of like my heroes. It was pretty incredible. That must have shaped your childhood, if not to some extent your life. Why are you and your brother creative types, musicians, artists? And w what is that all about? 
Well, when we when we were growing up, like when we were growing up, when we were really little, up until I was six years old, we lived uh, in Talon, Oregon, right outside of Ashland. And my mom worked at the Shakespeare Festival there. My dad was a furniture maker and she was a dresser in the back. And so often we'd get to go to work with her and sit off to the side. She was working on different things. And then we got to go see a lot of the shows. So we were seeing these Shakespearean dramas. We were seeing these crazy comedies out in this, you know, they have like a replica of the Globe Theater, I believe, or it's like fashioned after one of the original theaters. But it was, uh, it was really neat. It was, I guess we got immersed in, in a lot of the, the arts, especially theater. And then my dad played guitar and, and played music all the time. I had a great record collection and it was just always music playing. Did your parents support you guys going into the arts, into the performing arts as a, as a career? Oh yeah. The most, most definitely. I mean, we played sports too. Well, it's skateboard, <laughs> but we played baseball and stuff growing up and, and did that. But we, they were definitely adamant at like, my mom got me playing Suzuki violin uh, for a couple of years and piano lessons. And my brother played trumpet from about six years old on, I think. And um, so we played in band and then got into theater and just, I think, I don't know, you know, who knows why everybody does what they do, but I, I definitely think that was a great foundation that for us being able to be uh, in the sphere, like in the theater and stuff and, and being around music so much to have the passion for it, to want to dive in. And then they were as supportive as parents could possibly be. Like they definitely, you know, would scrape money together to buy me a saxophone so I could, you know, play on something better than the one we got from the next door neighbor, you know? And, you had your uh, next door neighbor's saxophone. Sounds like a yeah, privileged weird. childhood to me. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you what instruments you play. I was watching your video, I think, for your Patreon subscribers or just any of your videos, any of your work. And Gareth plays seemingly like I think I might have seen you with a harp. But the point is, I think I want to ask what instruments don't you play? You've made it your business <laughs> and part of your career and part of your current show to be able to be as multi-talented from self percussion to brass to woodwind, I guess. How am I doing to obviously guitars, more traditional instruments and dance like you can do anything musically, but what can't you do? Um, there's nothing I can't do if I put my mind to it. I have if a you certain, work hard enough, if you dedicate the time and energy, I have a certain set of skills <laughs> with a banjo. <laughs> He's gone. He, he shimmied away. And he's back. Um, no, they, uh, I, don't, I don't really play brass instruments very well. I, I, got, I got a couple cheapo, like a plastic trombone and uh, another little thing to try, but my five-year-old plays it better than I do. You should make that video. But, you should just do that bit where you slide off screen, grab an instrument, come back on, play a ditty, and just keep doing it until you've run out of talent. <laughs> Until you're just Wait. naked playing your nipples. Is that, yeah. is that a, do they make noise? Is that a thing? Wow. Wow. Um, I've, I've always gravi like wanted to try different things. And I've, I've definitely acquired more instruments than I've taken the time to play. Like we have that little mini cello in, in the back wall, but I've, I've played it and I've tinkered around with it and it's, and it's really fun. Uh, but I got that from my middle daughter when she was five, she saw a video of Yo-Yo Ma and was like, I'm doing this haven't always been the best at like tracking down good teachers for my hmm. kids stuff, but they've gotten to try a lot of things. Do they uh, allow you to teach them? No, they, uh, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's hard. It's hard. Like that, that, like I'd sit down next to, at the piano next to my daughter, my daughter, when she, my middle daughter, when she was like five and she really gravitated towards stuff. But as soon as I sat down to be like, Hey, let me show you this. She'd go, Right. <laughs> like it just yeah. took the fun out of it. <laughs> but it's over the years, we've gotten to like jam a little here and there. And we played together and they just, they, all three of my girls, like if you show them something, they can do it like musically. So it's, they're kind of, it's open-ended to what they want to do with that. Mm. 
where they want to take it. Shout but out yeah, to I, your three daughters, Lily, Sanoe, who you call Noe, and, and Makoa, who are 17, 13, and 5. And one of my yes. favorite things about you and about a lot of men is, is, is what kind, the very dedicated fathers. They really love being with their kids. They try to create a work-life balance to be with them and spend time with them to, to create opportunities for them. And I think most importantly, try to listen and learn how to be a better dad. And in this case, you're a girl dad, like, like me, you've got three girls, but I've always liked you relating to them. Sometimes they'll stop by the hangouts and I just love when, when you talk about them. And if there's time, I'd love to talk a little bit more about your role as a parent, as a dad. Cause I think you probably, you know, you, it's such a primary thing for you and your wife been married 22 years, but I got to ask you, you about just, couple i mean you've had a fascinating career uh you've been a street performer you've done pretty much everything you've lived in new york you've auditioned for broadway shows you've got close to some really big shows and you also were in this show uh, it used to be called dixie stampede and then they <laughs> dropped the dixie but you they were did. in this show as dolly parton owned it i guess and you were in yep. it for like t- how many years and like five thousand shows yeah, yeah, five thousand shows over ten years. Uh, as a dinner show, kind of. I think I think they borrowed the idea from Medieval Times and then like ran with what they were doing. And I was a hillbilly comedian character that would break up the show from time to time. It was it was a good experience uh, performance wise to like learn how to play to these big crowds of twelve hundred people in the in the house, and then you do five hundred shows a year. So you had to like figure out how to just make it new every single day. And, and I did have a little bit of freedom to like start kind of throwing out my own ideas and, and throwing out jokes that I thought of and re kind of crafting what was originally like a, a pretty bad script, I guess. You also rode the actual horses like in the show and you also took care of the horses, like the people that apparently performed at Dixie Stampede also cleaned it up after it and did every job. And uh, yeah, yeah. We had to like literally had a chore list and stuff. So we're like, ta-da, we're the performers. And they were like, literally shoveling horse shit. Yeah. And, uh, but it was, it was, there was like, it was a weird place to work because it was, there was a lot of bad things about it and it wasn't run the best. I uh, didn't treat you the best, but like you got to work with these beautiful horses and I learned all about them. I took care of a team of Belgians and never would have had that experience. I learned how to ride and worked with a lot of great people. But at, at the end of the day, I, I, w- I was never happier to leave a job in my life. And also you mentioned it was the theme of it was the civil war. And there were like the audience would be actually on different sides. Is that right? Yes. And you being a guy who is pretty much as seemingly always been aware of at least history, much less politics, much less the current temperature in America. They since changed it. You were telling me, but what yes. was wh- Dolly? Dolly forced the drop of, of Dixie huh. and they've apparently changed the theme of it, thankfully. But it was always just, there was like, it was, it was weird. It was wrong. It was weird. And it got a lot of blowback too. When she dropped the name, people were like furious, like, well, I'll never come again. But of course that's not how they talk. I don't know how that was a Southern accent. <laughs> I got to work on it. Yeah, I will not attend this non Dixie stamp. <laughs> I can't yeah. believe you've dropped <laughs> the Dixie from the show. <laughs> I care so much about Confederate history. How dare you? Um, so yeah. You know, because just there's people that suck out there. And <laughs> I, you know, I look back and I'm like, how, wait, how did I like feel right about working there? I, I don't know. You know, you can only kind of look back and, and realize things at whatever point you're at, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, out of that, you gain obviously a tremendous amount of experience and thousands and thousands of shows and lots of people meeting lots of people, including your wife, right? Yeah. The day I started working there, she was uh, a server there, which was, they were kind of put on a show too, as they served their wow, that probably their made chickens it to the people. Really mm-hmm. hard for you to meet other women from that point on as a performer. <laughs> wow. Maybe you should have waited <laughs> yeah. for like a I thousand know. shows. Yeah. She, we kind of just met eyes as, as you do. And, uh, I think we both knew, we just knew that like, yeah, this is, this is my person. And, uh, I mean, we, I think we moved in together after our first date. 
kind of accidentally, but it, that's how it happened. And we were together ever since. Yeah. And, you seem to be pretty in what little I've, you know, we've talked about your marriage. You seem pretty enamored with your wife of, of, of 22 years. She's an artist herself, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's a phenomenal artist can kind of work in any medium and just, I really love her style, just how she approaches things. She creates, she paints and creates works. She used to do a, a lot of like embroidery kind of stuff. Now she's, and then, but she's always been a painter. And uh, she also does like dessert stuff, like sculpted cake kind of things that are just extraordinary. Say a word, if you will, because you kept coming back to this in our conversation kind of on your own your first daughter was born like in a, in a pool, you did like a natural birth and you were supposed to have a midwife, but the midwife didn't show up, which is a crazy story in itself, but you've got three daughters and. Yep. Oh, I, I did just want to say that not to go on about that initial experience, but the weirdest thing was with, like my wife gave birth essentially by herself, like in this baby pool, we didn't know we were that far along. It happened. The midwife messed up, should have been there, but we we took when we did take her in to the doctor to get the initial like infant checkup and everything because the midwife did show up that day later uh, and sorted through things. But when we walked into the doctor's office, there's my wife having just given birth on her own, completely naturally, and I think I was I must I wasn't even holding the baby. But all the nurses and every and the people that working at the front desk they had kind of heard the story. And they came up to me and they were like, you delivered the baby. And I'm like, like, I couldn't believe it. Like how and these are like ladies that are working in a obstetrician's office. Like, and that's their first thing is like, as if I, uh, that you were given any, any credit there yeah. well, to be fair. You like, did dance I'm, and and hit your body the entire time. You made noises. Like, Come on, you can do it. Come on, get back to it. Push that baby out. Boom. And so you deserve the credit, I think. I actually just. I think so. I sang harmony with myself. So I just gave birth myself yeah. just while you're yeah. in it. So, well, what I was going to say, I'm is here for you. You actually just did it. What I was going to say, you interrupted me and kind of did it, which is throughout our conversation, talking about your wife, talking about your daughters, you kind of came back and kept giving credit to women and 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 saying that you we get too much in, in in a way and i just you know you talk about the way you talk about your your daughters and raising them and, and what they do and and i just wonder where you come to when it comes to these these gender issues and equality i mean how are you raised and why is it that that you feel the way that you feel about these issues because it's clear how you see it I, I, I my mom was a really strong presence in my life and very like uh, outspoken activist for social justice and, you know, work with the rainbow coalition early on. I remember going to rallies with her and, uh, wow. with Jesse Jackson during his, his run, I believe. And, uh, and from her early years, like in college and stuff, she was marching and, and speaking out and it's kind of throughout her life. And so I like, and she was, one of my best friends, like through my life, you know, she was kind of that person that I would talk to in any situation on my mom. Uh, she passed three years ago, but that's what, just to explain why I'm saying it in past tense. But, um, I think that definitely instilled in me and my brother and sister, uh, an awareness of the, I just, the, even the basic idea that, Oh, everybody should be treated with respect and dignity and hopefully equally. And I said, end, but I didn't have another thing. Well, that's hilarious. But also <laughs> you live with your wife and daughters in, in our uh, Missouri. Yes. And South, Southwest Missouri, you don't strike me as a particularly confrontational fella, but how are you guys feeling in Missouri with all that has happened in the country, specifically as it affects, you know, women's reproductive rights. Like I yeah. said, your daughters are 17, 13 and five. And you have the views that you just articulated. It's really interesting to hear about your mom. Really interesting. And it, it explains a lot as to why I, 
I can sense your your decency on on these issues and your your enlightenment on them. But what? How are you guys doing in Missouri and thinking about it? Do you ever? I mean, do you ever square off with people? I mean, you're a public guy. You're performing there. You don't want to be a divisive person, but it must yeah. be. I'm. At, what are your thoughts on it? What's happening? It's yeah. It's 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 terrible. And it, our Missouri was one of the was it the trigger laws where it just immediately popped in. And I mean, it, it's, it's that, just that idea that, that any of these people and these lawmakers should have a say in what individual does in their individual circumstances with their body and with their life, with their time, like on the planet, like, cause that's what it boils down to. Like, it's so easy for people to just go, nope, nope, nope. This is everybody has to do it and go through with it. And like it, I don't think people fully give weight and credit to the amount of just like what your body goes through in a pregnancy, what, how that dictates and mandates the rest of how the rest of your life will be spent and how, how you will be able to lead it. So just that and alone, like, yes, of course, like obviously no matter how you individually feel about abortion at whatever stage it's, I don't see how it could be, somebody else's decision over how your life is allowed to play out, I guess. But then, and then you think of all the other circumstances beyond that, that are just get worse and worse and worse, where it's like desperate for somebody to, to get help or give. And then uh, places like Missouri and Texas have made it so difficult to even just have the healthcare aspect of a doctor being able to make that decision to terminate. You know, what's ironic is I'm sitting here talking to you and you're making these thoughtful points. You make a living making noises out of anything that please people. And yet the chair that the chair that you're sitting in is really destroying this interview. It's <laughs> the, the highest irony I've ever I think, dealt with during an interview. I'm like, this guy can make. I don't know, he's put a yoga mat. Happy. He's put a yoga mat on a bucket. And now it, it oh, what a relief. This, the, enjoy the so let me ask you. I know I'm keeping that. I didn't that. know I got these noise cancel headphones. I had no idea. I'm keeping so that all in because it was worth it. Uh, so, uh, given what you just said, what about the other? You know, part of my question. You're there in Missouri. You've got three daughters. You're a, probably, probably a pretty well known guy locally. And do you ever engage people when it comes to politics over the last? You know, since Trump was elected before, or and and has the repeal the ban on abortion changed or affected those conversations any differently? You know, you ever have any kind of conservative or Trump knowing friends, neighbors that are drawing the line at this or anything else? <laughs> um, I, I will say there has like, I don't, there's not a lot of chatter. Like when I go to basketball games or, you know, these places where I do interact with a, a wider array of, of, of people. There's not a lot of people just spouting off like their, their beliefs or leanings. They're just yelling at the refs, which is totally fine. <laughs> totally fine. But, uh, it, re it really, when I first moved here, I heard a lot more terrible stuff. Cause it was, I think I was just around a lot of like 20 somethings and, you know, people just always wanting to tell you their newest favorite racist joke. And I would yell at them or get pissed or call them out or something. And they just thought I was uptight, which I might be. But uh, I th I think we, do, we don't really go out a ton. Like we kind of do our own thing. And so I don't really end up interacting with a lot of people that have contentious disagreement, you right. know, with. Right. But when I hear stuff or when I like when you're it's hard not to say something when you hear something, people talking at a store or this and that. And I I've, I've gotten to a point now where I just I do say my piece and I but I try not to be a jerk about it. And just if somebody tries to like, hey, right. Yeah. You know, and I def I deflect that. I don't go along with bullshit things when people are trying to throw out really terrible thoughts on the issues or whatever. I'm, I'm really bad at thinking of specific circumstances or conversations, but I know I've, I've run across these recently. There was one lady at Petco. Oh no. Now she's in trouble that it was the day 
the day or the day after that decision went down and, and she was like, boy, a rough day, huh? And I was like, oh well, yeah, yeah, it's messed up, huh? And she was like, yeah, let me tell you there, you know, and she just went off on a diatribe about how it was so wrong. And it was the last lady just, you know, if you'd walked up and run, a, run into her, you wouldn't have expected. She her was to... upset that Roe v. Wade had been overturned. Yeah. She was upset that a, yeah. abortion had been banned. In and your she state. was, yeah. I don't know, if goatee, the cut of my jib, but whatever she, she assumed she could you speak don't... freely. So she did. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. You don't have a particularly open-minded looking face. You're a white man with, uh, you know, a chin hair, good set yeah, of hair. It's because I don't actually have a chin. It just goes. Right. Yeah. Man, that's why I don't have a jaw. But yet she, uh, she, that's interesting. It's always interesting how you, you might be seen in such a situation. Well. Yeah. But I think you do, you, you do get a sense of people sometimes and it's not like yeah. just uh, reading them, you know, the, the cover or anything. It's like, I don't know. You were also wearing a Planned Parenthood T-shirt. <laughs> yes, I don't know where she... I do. I, I do have that tattoo, and so when I <laughs> wearing the midriff, it's right across the belly button. So I was wondering, you know, as we were talking earlier, and as I've gotten to know you, and as I'm kind of going through a, an evolution and enlightenment myself, and trying to evolve and 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 work on the things that aren't great about yeah. me, you always seem like a guy who is very kind of laid back and, and even keeled. And, you know, I talked with you about your life and how, if at all, you'd struggled uh, with anything, drugs, alcohol, depression. We had a good talk about that. And, you know, it wasn't anything too crazy outstanding for you in, in, in those ways, but you're such a thunder being a performer, being a dad of, of three kids, much less three daughters, being well-known, especially when you're on the cruise ships, you're like famous you know, what is, what role does ego play for you? Do you get upset? What upsets you? You seem to be like laid back and, and thoughtful and, and fun to be around type of guy. Am I missing something? Are you a monster? We'll find out. We'll just find out together. <laughs> You've got to push him. You've got to really push him. <laughs> Come on. You've got to uh, rush the stage <laughs> and try to take his shit for him to really get upset. I don't know if my family would describe me as laid back and lovely. Do you raise your voice? I, ever? I, I, Oh yeah. Okay. But you know, I I get mad about the dumb stuff. Like, and that's, I think, I think I was talking to you earlier going, I, I appreciate your openness about like, you know, trying to work on reasonable responses to things, reasonable reactions to things your kids do or your wife does or, or, or anything really. And my like cliff bar rappers, since my daughters were like five years old, they just leave them. They mm. just eat them and they just leave them. And it's never changed. And so no, that's like, I hate, I, I hate always using the word like trigger, but that I see that and I'm just like, Ooh! you know, but it's the stupid stuff. Do you hate messes? No, no, I'm I'm not like cleanly. I just, it's the pick up yeah. after yourself kind of thing. So it's just that, that I, uh, so little, little things just kind of infuriate me. And I try, I really, that's something I'm striving for is, is, not necessarily reasonable, but like just allowing a, a realistic response to whatever I'm, I'm dealing with or encountering or whatever. But you see a few, you know, dirty dishes sitting there from two days before it's. I keep reading and hearing and thinking about these, you know, enlightened thinkers that I'm reading from Pema Chodron to mm. Sharon Salzberg. to uh, That was my mom's favorite was. Uh, oh, really? How do you say it? I don't know if it's Pima or Pema. It might be Pima Chodron. C H O D R U M. I think Puma would I be think funnier. Puma would mean she's of older mom, and I think that <laughs> Pima is a Buddhist monk, and I don't want to <laughs> no. sexualize her. Is it Puma? Is that a? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I always think of uh, that that uh, Smothers Brothers routine. Do you know that one? There's Pumas in that crevice. I don't. I have no, no idea yeah. what you're talking about. It's really getting me off track <laughs> of what I'm trying to say, which is is. The idea of realizing that your reaction that you normally have or you're about to have is going to really destroy like the next few moments at, yeah. at, at yeah. best, at best. And you or, can see it. You can see. Well, it happening. can you? That's the problem. I haven't been able to. I've started to be able to see it. I but in, uh, I never could see it. The fact that you're saying you can see it is oh, shows, yeah. shows your growth where you are 
on no, the no, path. No, no. The, the, see, the thing is, is I've always been able to see it. And the, myself outside myself is like, yeah, I'm going for it. Do it. <laughs> I think. What is it. that? Do it again. <laughs> what, what is that? What do you name that moment when you go for it, when you have the reaction that you you end up regretting because it, it, it ruined that moment. And it might have you even say just, the thing you yeah. uh, ruin the relationship, at least yeah. temporarily, if not for good in certain <clears throat> cases, what do you, what do you call that? How do you see that moment? Cause that's, I wasn't planning on talking about that with you, but that's my thing right now. This is, this that's, is where I'm at. I'm thinking, I, I, I call it tragic. <laughs> it's, it's Cause you always take the bait. The, the moment of no return. The, I, I do. I don't know. I, I feel like I have grown, I, I, especially in the last few years. I've kind of, there's been some switches. I think I was talking to you earlier about like really working my whole life or wanting, wanting this idealistic view of how I should wake up every morning, work out, meditate, practice the things that I love to do. And it should all be like, that should be a no brainer. That should be simple, <clears throat> but there's something, something keeping away, whether it's, just easily distracted, whether it's, uh, you know, doing the laundry, sweeping the floor, do it, getting the kid ready and all, and allowing that all to like consume your time. And then realizing you sat for a half hour answering one email, but yeah, well you which, sound a lot it's like a carefully crafted email. Yeah. You sound a lot like me on this, but you also <laughs> mentioned the one thing you have been able to sustain and do every day is running. You become a serious runner and i think the answer though to what you're saying is i've tried meditation on and off but i've never been able to do it every day and now if i don't do it i feel no i mean i i just think that that running for you is the thing that you've been able to do every day and for me now i'm feeling that way about meditation otherwise it's hard for people like us because we're scattered and we're yeah creative types i don't know how you excuse it i'm always jealous of anybody who has a to-do <laughs> list that crosses it off what? all day but I can't remember. I was I was just listening to one of the interviews from maybe it was last week. Was it Mara Quint was yeah. saying uh, like everybody says to do one thing at a time. Yeah. Oh no, it was Sophia. I think do one thing at a time, and then that just means like everything else can go to hell, and I'm just going to forget about everything else. And I I can't do one thing at a time. I just right. I, I, I try not to use that word can't, but I, I can't do. It. I struggle with it too. You're but, playing 15 instruments right now. I mean, I, I hear you and I, I, I relate to that. And I, think I, I do think, do you think the running, the, the running, I think is one of the things that helped me make that switch and help me like actually try to accomplish tasks rather than half doing a hundred things is getting myself to follow through with that. And, and once you're running and you keep running and you run for an hour or yeah. something like you, it, it's very empowering, I think to, to know that, oh, I decided to do this and, and kind of everything we've talked about and combine it at all. I want to know what your work life balance is like, specifically because you're a guy who's an artist who's created his own company, Buckets and Boards. See them live this Thursday night. And you're also traveling, though. You do the Disney cruise lines and you'll go out for a week at a time or longer sometimes. And we talked a little bit about that. And I know a little bit about it as as a comedian. And I've struggled with that work life balance over my career. And now I'm starting to re refine it. But how do you do such a good job as a dad to your three daughters and also be behind this business, which requires a tremendous amount of attention and work and travel you guys have been going all over the place for gigs how are how are how do you rate yourself how do you what are the secrets <laughs> but you know you hope you hope to be a good dad you hope to like give the attention that that your kids deserve and 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 i've always want to be a part of the things they're doing and so yeah when we first started doing the cruises 10 years ago it was it was difficult it was difficult for me to be away and it was like 10 times more difficult for my wife to all of a sudden, you know, a random week at a time, just be saddled with everything. And after over years of doing that, where we do, you know, 12 to 15 weeks a year, a week here, a week here, a week here, it, we realized that that wasn't the optimal way to do it. I mean, we knew that, but we had to kind of depend on it for a while. And when we got to a point where we didn't have to go as all in on, on the cruises, 
we started pulling back and started negotiating, doing smaller runs. A lot of times now we'll go out for three or four days. And a lot of the, the theater work that we're focusing on now, uh, taking the show to performing arts centers is sometimes two days out, boom, boom. And then home for a week or, you know, you're always trying to find a different balance, especially when you're not always in charge of dictating when you work. It's a lot of it is up to who hires you, where and when. So we're trying to get a better handle on that where we can, you know, manifest the the schedule that we want. And we uh, since coming back to into being able to do more work, um, we've we've. I feel done a lot better job of that. And, and cause it was, it was, yeah, it was really hard to be away and on a ship you sometimes didn't have internet for days at a time or it would be wonky. You'd finally get everybody on a, on a call and then it would drop out, you know, a one minute in and your, my wife was dealing with, you know, this catastrophe after another and you're just helpless. And as much as it sucks to feel helpless in that situation, like it way worse to actually just have to deal with the situation by yourself. So yeah, there's so much give and take to being, I guess, enabled to do work that is joyful and that you love. Then hopefully at the end of the day, there's a trade off where it provides the ability to provide like a good life for your family and, and, opportunities for all the kids and everybody to do the things that they want to do. So I guess that's the idea in the long run. And boy, it, it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes it takes a long time to come to these realizations and try to start to make sense of it all. But I do feel like in a much better place now than years ago where it was just much more stressful and, I don't, I, I I think in general, I just, I wasn't, I thought I was really attentive and I wasn't mm. paying as much attention and aware of what everybody else was dealing with as I thought I was, you know, I had this picture of, of how I was going through the world. And then if you are lucky enough to find out that you got the wrong picture in your head, then you can, I don't know, get a, more finely tuned image and, and zero in on what what's important, I guess. Because you're such a thoughtful guy and love your wife and daughter so much, I would imagine the hardest thing, as you just said, was when you're on, say, a Disney cruise ship for over a week is missing your kids. Then the second hardest thing, or I don't know why I would rate them, is the guilt. <laughs> in this order. The guilt that you described about, you know, your wife is home with three kids, the you know, the, the washing machine, the dishwasher is broken. The car has an issue. She's carting yeah. around and, and you feel those things, but you're, you're making money. You're sending it back. She's definitely got the much harder job. You're on a goddamn dip, the happiest people in the world performing, yeah. doing what you love to do. And then you're off Ordering time room service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's gotta Run, be going for a jog on the Island. Exactly. When you meanwhile, your your wife is dealing with like two sick kids and running to the grocery store and this thing broke down and you are on an island. You're not really. <laughs> I mean, the point yeah. I'm making is that that proves kind of, I think, how thoughtful you were and how you, you know, you, you try to balance that out. But also, you know, it's it's the idea that you can have that type of, I think, relationship and that type of of life to be able to do it is, is fantastic. But ideally my question to you is I'd love for this community to be able to help you a little bit or a lot to have the ideal type of gig. So across America, people are listening. What kind of theater, like what kind of venues would you guys love to perform in 1200 seats, 200 seats? Like what works for you guys where <clears throat> listeners have this? Because I, I say this so easily. So many listeners have gone to see you and I've witnessed your talent and Matt's and you guys are amazing. And people love the experience that they have. Their kids love the experience. It's a family fun experience. And I'd love for more people to see it. And awesome. for you to not necessarily awesome. have to be out, you know, on cruise ships and stuff. There's any way this audience can support you guys and, yeah. and, and win themselves. Not only this Thursday night by buying a ticket and watching live, but, you know, having you, uh, what do you want to do? Ideally, what would be best for you to have that work-life balance? We, uh, 
Well, I, I, I had mentioned maybe earlier that we started focusing on performing arts center touring and <clears throat> we've been lucky enough to get quite a few as we've kind of dove into that arena. We had done a smattering of them in the past. And then now uh, we've started booking a lot more where we'll go up to Minnesota and do a handful of shows over a weekend at three different theaters. And, and it's sometimes it is 400 seat houses. Sometimes it's a 2000 seat theater with 200 people. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It's a, uh, I mean, 2000 seat theater filled. Is, I, that's the hope. That's but, a, yeah, that's uh, a great, that's a great paycheck. And I mean, I just, you guys are the type of talent that should be able to make really good amount of money in one gig. And then you have free time to do whatever you want. You're that, you guys are that good. When I see Springsteen <laughs> getting $6,000, like Springsteen just isn't $6,000 better than the experience people are going to have at buckets and boards. I, I actually really <laughs> believe that. Like, I believe there is a cost of <clears throat> premium and I believe that you guys are good enough to get, you know, to deserve to be able to do 2000 seat nice. rooms and, and make good money on that gig and yeah. then go back and hang out with your family. That's the dream, I think. Nice. Yeah, that's that's where we've been kind of focusing our efforts so that we can do that. And traveling in the States is so much easier to keep in touch with our families. Sure. And you're actually like, you know, uh, available, I guess. And so, yeah, we've been doing a lot of those and uh, traveled to a lot of states already. And I've been doing all of our booking for well, I mean, we started 16 years ago, so essentially 16 years, but like 12 years as a business. And uh, we're just now signing with a Harmony Artists. I think they're out of L.A. Uh, it's a great guy. Jerry Ross will be repping us. And Shout out to Jerry Ross right here on the podcast. And uh, so it, we are we are bookable. We're, we're going to be showcasing at a couple upcoming uh, theater conferences in Ohio in September and in, at APAP in New York city in January. And, uh, we were just hoping to kind of build on, on the touring and build on it in such a way. Luckily, both of us in the group, in the business have a similar outlook, have a, a similar perspective of wanting to find an always better and better work-life balance yeah. and, and, and create that. So we're not just like, ourselves out on on either end and uh so yeah we're 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 hoping to just continue building that and continue building on the momentum to travel all over the place we haven't done a west coast tour yet we're hoping to do that and east coast uh we've done a lot of midwest and a little bit south but well uh, i uh i hope that you know the the you know putting the spotlight on you as you've had at our zooms and with your jingles here on the show it you know gives some sells a few tickets you know at least because seeing you you know it'd be, it'd be so great to to see you guys succeed and you're such a great guy and you've been uh you're such a talented guy so i'm, I'm psyched to be able to, to talk to you and hope people will will go watch this thursday have you thought though i i, I feel kind of like uncomfortable making the suggestion because you're so talented. I don't know anything about music, but have you thought about taking like buckets and boards and making it like a theme show where like, it's about the civil war and you pit the audience against each other, North versus South, almost like just, Dixie stampede, it's which un, you, that's unnecessary. That's what you want started. How, have you how thought dare about you? How dare bringing you? <laughs> you know, horses? Have you thought about bringing a horse into the show? We've had, we've had lots of people like come up to us over the years and go, Hey, you know, what would be awesome. It would be great if, like, <laughs> once you guys get a few more people in the show and there's, like, like there's, like, five or six of you, maybe, like, eight, eight people. And then you're, like, and they describe, they go on for, like, minutes. And then <laughs> and this one guy I do that from another show. He stopped me in the middle of a grocery store. I was just, like, oh, no, worse. It was a Walgreens. And he goes, he said all this for, like, three minutes. Yeah. And he goes, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I I actually haven't seen your your, <laughs> your show. <laughs> I feel really bad. I just have this picture of what I think oh, it should God. be. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine, man. Um, no, we like it with two people. <laughs> We're that's good. Great. It's, it have you thought about is. having the audience, uh, put the fine. audience against each other and then have them <laughs> fight each other for just for the percussion? Just yes. the, the slapping. <laughs> have you thought about doing that lots with buckets of, of boards? Lots of good ideas. You know, I, the Kingsman, uh, that scene where they just <laughs> all in the church, just, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Listen, if you don't like my ideas, you don't have to be a dick about it. I'm just throwing okay. them out there. I'm just okay. saying a Civil War theme might sell more tickets. 
You know what? And speaking of, when you guys do your uh, trifecta tour, you know, the three three heads is... Oh, what yes. Is the, what's oh, it called? Big Christian mouth. Three Smart mouths. mouths, yes. Swap mouths? Smart mouth. S- yes. Smart mouth. Yeah, it's a team. Swamp, swamp mouth. Smart mouth, yeah. I mean, I think what would actually make it work, actually, oh, is, is if uh, you had a... Uh, like an opening act and maybe in between each of your uh, little bits, like do like something exciting, like, like a percussive kind of like driving, like energetic, something with a lot of energy. And you know what I mean? That really gets people I interested. Cap- I, don't think- <laughs> Captain Andy. I don't know that a, they were interested to begin with B that any of the three of us have that kind of physical energy and C now you're making me think that we should have you guys open for us, but then you would be. Thinking- ah, yes. You would guess it would be selling all the tickets and then we just take the money. So I'm just not sure. I think you guys are going to figure it out. We'll figure it out in post. You guys are going to be huge. And I'm very excited to uh, (laughs) talk with you today, Garrett. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to, to be a part of this, this whole community and everything. And, and, and I think I've mentioned it before, but getting the opportunity to uh, create these, these little uh, intro jingles and stuff. And then, Beyond that, getting to try them out during the hangouts and, and make stuff up and then getting a, a sounding board for that and getting like feedback. It's been for me, it's been this like really incredible experience. And I've always my whole life wanted to write music <laughs> and never had the focus to be able to just write it down and just try it, just record something. Because I always wanted it to be like perfect. So I, if I did record anything, I'd just sit on it for a while and never revisit it because i didn't know how to like make it exact so and and this has given me this opportunity to just kind of play and create things that i that i'd always wanted to in like a smaller not smaller way but like uh because it's like these little short form songs uh, i don't know it's it's been an incredibly great you can't describe how good those are Mm -hmm. and i have struggle to try to capture them and share them to a wider group because you literally write them about a person or the conversation that night so i guess it's just a reason to subscribe and (laughs) hopefully you'll be lucky enough to to witness one of garrett's brilliant Uh, improvised riffs because they're they're really really something special so we're happy that you do it we're 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 the ones who are benefiting so that's that's fantastic and you're awesome and i will let you go but gareth I so appreciate you and we're all very grateful to have you be a part of this community. You're such a good guy and such a talented guy. And I hope all of your dreams and your family's dreams all come true. Uh, thank you, man. And I, like I said, thank you so much for, for, for taking the time with me and for making me feel a part of everything. It's, it's incredible. And, and I have so much respect for you and uh, gravitated towards your voice. When I first heard you on XM, because literally I, there was nowhere else I heard somebody having an actual like conversation. Like I just, if it didn't exist in my orbit, like, so I clicked by you on the station and heard just this open-ended conversation with somebody. And I think it was somebody you didn't agree with. And then I listened more and more and keep hearing these, these conversations that where you seemed legitimately interested in hearing what the other person had to say. And it was just, that was like brand new, you know, and I, and I think it's beautiful what you've done and what you continue to do. And I think it's an even uh, better format now that you, that you have because you can do exactly what you want with it. Well, so, I'm happy to hear you say that. And uh, we're really just so grateful to have you be a part of it and in it as far as you're, this is it. You've been a guest. You're on the show and we're so excited to have you and hopefully everybody goes and watches Thursday night. Put it in your calendar, everybody. Thursday night, you can live stream buckets and boards, get your tickets and go support Gareth. Gareth, thank you very much. Right on. Thank you. All right. There he goes. Gareth Sever, everybody. Such a treat. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and uh, a great wide-ranging conversation with Gareth. Of course, thanks again to Mike Grunwald, who is always awesome. And to you for listening. I hope you'll join us Thursday night to watch Buckets of Boards live. And I hope you'll sign up for a paid subscription if you haven't already. Go to standupwithpete.com right now. 
That's it. That's all I've got for you. I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow, hearing from you anytime on the Discord chat. If you're a subscriber, a community member, email me anytime, standupapete at gmail.com and be the change you want to see in the world. I'll talk to you tomorrow. John Carroll, taking us out. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, look, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, or you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw the land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in. With other causes for laws and since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the would begin, they had to stand up, all right, they had to stand up, we got to stand up, we got to look the devil square in the eye, we got to let him know, it's his time to go, to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 